Warning, Star Trek from the holodeck contains adult language and discussions. If you're easily offended, do not continue to listen. Walk it alone! Fire! Holodeck 3 program is reinstated. Open sesame! Commander Klingon vessel. We are energizing transport of him. Now. Welcome, everyone, to Star Trek from the Holodeck. I am Michael, your host and captain of the USS Rain Man Digital. And at the helm with me is David Subal. Hello, David. How's it going, everybody? All right. So today we're going to be breaking down two episodes. That's right. Two episodes. We have fallen behind and I figured let's just get it done. So we're going to be talking about season three, episode seven of Star Trek Picard titled Surrender, followed by episode eight. Dominion. I believe I have those backwards. You have it backwards. But it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. People know what I'm talking about. Well, especially since, you know, like, take it into context, episodes seven and eight absolutely feel like an old school TNG, you know, part one, part two yep. type of episode. That's true. Maybe that was the whole point. Maybe that. Uh, well, also, we had mentioned earlier in the season that every three to four episodes feel like their own individual movies almost. Yeah. So. That's probably what they just did with these two episodes. Yeah, that's what definitely, especially when you get when when you get to that cliffhanger in the middle uh, at the end of episode seven. That was the first time in the entire season where I really felt I have to actually continue and watch what happens in episode eight, not just because of how good that cliffhanger was, but there was just some narrative beats to me that seemed missing in episode seven that you needed in episode eight, because like since then, if you look at all the other episodes, like episodes one through six, you don't get that feeling. Yeah. You get that feeling. Okay. Well, we'll, we're going to get another chapter of the, of the story in the next episode. Cool. But you have that really, I always felt that after every episode, okay, I just got a good chunk of the story. Yeah. You are right. There was something missing. There's a, there was something off with episode seven, Dominion. It was probably the weakest episode of the season so yes. far. And that's saying something because this was still a strong episode. It, it wasn't was strong. A, it wasn't a bad episode. Mm-mm. But if we had to point to one episode that wasn't the best of the season, episode seven, Dominion would definitely be that. But when you combine Dominion and Surrender into one discussion or one episode, it feels far more complete. The seventh episode just, it felt they were stutter stepping a bit. Yeah. They were taking their time. And I, I understand that every season has an episode, especially when you're looking at, you know, 10 to 12 episode seasons nowadays, they usually have an episode towards the latter half of the third quarter that slows things way down. And it gives the audience a chance to take a breath, catch up, and let some of the aspects that they have been building towards yeah. marinate a bit. And that's what essentially episode seven was. Where they allow the audience to catch up and then they answer a few things. Yeah, it was kind of like episode seven to me felt like, all right, we went from 90 miles per hour to all of a sudden we're going to go the speed limit. We're going to go 65 now in, in episode seven. And they kind of, I like what they did in episodes. Don't get me wrong. I like the stuff they did because it gave us more gravitas to Vatic and Amanda Plummer's portrayal of Vatic has more depth now because of episode seven. Dark as hell, man. It's dark as hell. And it's like, okay, it really gives us that new, that brand new feeling we had since deep space nine where when you leave off Deep Space Nine, the Dominion War, and a lot of people kind of glaze over it, the Federation did something truly horrible. And yeah, in the did story, the Federation or did the Section Thirty One? Section Thirty One. There is a distinction. Yeah, but and Section Thirty One still is Federation. Eh, the the one hand doesn't know what the other hand's doing. Isn't that the whole idea of Section Thirty One? That was the yeah. It has autonomy. That was one of the most awesome elements of Deep Space Nine. Was like. 
the Federation, basically Section 31, did something that was so morally egregious for all the other characters. Because, like, I, I'll never forget when Cisco came to realize that he used a bioweapon on them and he was like he was like no that's that's immoral if we're talking about re- star trek yes i would agree it feels very weird and dark if we're talking reality oh yeah the, if we're talking reality the dominion was murdering people they were genocidal they were taking over the galaxy they had no empathy they didn't care about anyone they were intent on complete domination and control and destroying the solids as they call them yes so i mean you got to defend yourself Oh, yeah. And if that means biological warfare, then so be it, David. (laughs) Let them die. Let them die. But, like, I like that we finally get almost kind of like this weird narrative closure about the Dominion War and kind of, like, bring up the fact that, yeah, the Federation is not complacent in what they did as well. However, it doesn't excuse, just like what you said, the, the Dominion was just as bad. But it's it it was cool seeing a motivation for a villain being used like that, like what we saw in episode seven. And that's what honestly episode seven, the importance of episode seven to me was like, and I put it in my notes was absolutely separating Vatic from the atypical star Trek villain. Yeah. She's gra- She's grandiose. She's gra- She has gravitas, but they gave her so much depth in that, in, in that episode because of not only the narrative beats, but also the performance of Amanda Plummer. I kind of glaze over the fact that basically we start her step. So these last two episodes, more or less the, the first half slowed things down in order to sort through what the prior episodes have set up. We now understand how this new faction of changelings have risen as you were alluding to a few moments ago. Not sure how many have actually united, how many changelings have actually united behind Vatic. That's been left a bit ambiguous, but it doesn't seem to rival the actual original Great Link, and the numbers seem relatively small. Yes. So Vatic and several of her fellow changelings, this is the backstory, went under excruciating torture from members (laughs) of the Daystrom Institute. It was very, very Nazi type of experimentation that was going on. And I'm not sure, David, as a Star Trek fan, how I feel about that. It bothered me a bit. Oh, Seeing absolutely. something like that in Star Trek, not because I'm opposed to violence and real horror and terror in the world of Star Trek, but the fact that it happened under the Federation's watch, that bothers me. And I'm not sure mm-hmm. if I like that they're continuing this trend to dirty the Federation. But it goes, it goes to what you said, though. By that time, what is the Federation if it's being run by Section 31? They weren't being run by Section 31. Or, or if they were, if they have that element, you know, the right hand right. doing something that the left hand doesn't. Correct. Doesn't know about, then it, it, using, the, uh, that, that's why I loved about it in, in honesty, because, like, there was a lot of use of narrative irony when it comes to the idea of the Federation doing something that it probably doesn't know what was going on. Right. And the, just the, the twisted way that they were trying to do it. I mean, the, I will never look at the humming of three blind mice ever again. And when you think about it, three bl- the, the whole, you'll never look at it use the same. of that. I'll never look at it the same because like, now that you bring that up about like, how the section 31 it's the left it's the right hand doing what the left hand doesn't know about it really is kind of like what they said it's three blind mice they don't they don't know what's going on but this is still happening and you're right it was it's i i definitely see it in the fan base with that episode that they were like oh here we go making starfleet darker i don't think it ruins anything but we do need to be careful and that's what i'm I always say when we delve into this type of territory, Mm -hmm. we have to understand that the Federation Starfleet represents a form of humanity that has reached a certain point in their evolution. Yeah. And it's supposed to be this optimistic point in our lives as humans that we've overcome tragedy and darkness and self-destructive behavior to rise above and become what we see in Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm okay with, dirtying it up a bit 
especially because, as I said before, Star Trek represents many times our stories in different eras of Star Trek reflects and or refracts the current issues of the time. Now, currently, you can say that many of us are very distrustful of our institutions. We don't longer look at our institutions as necessarily powers that care about us. They seem to have their own uh, designs and intent and have left many of us. I'm talking, of course, like the U.S. government and all of the other subsequent institutions under that banner. A lot of us look to them distrustful. So for Star Trek to do what they did in Discovery and even to do what they're doing now makes sense if they're trying to refract the times. Yes. And by doing that, by dirtying up the Federation you are getting that that metaphor of distrusting our institutions or at least posing those questions. Can we trust our institutions? That was the thing that I was like thinking about when I watched that episode again. And I was like trying to think about, especially the re- reception it got from the Star Trek fans. How much is it that basically people are, people didn't like that episode because what episode? Their fe- the, the episode seven mm-hmm. with with Vatic. How is it that Did basically people not like it? Pe- a lot. So people didn't like it because they said, "Oh, it's the darker side of Star Trek coming out again." But it's how much is that? Like what you were saying is people being jaded against that type of storytelling. I also people being ready. I think, and I think that goes hand in hand with jaded. A lot of people view Kurtzman era as doing this too much. So probably mm-hmm. they are ready to pounce on something that they feel is maligning what Star Trek was intended to be. Mm-hmm. Even though I, I agree that it's a, it's dangerous territory to return again and again. I don't feel like it destroys anything in this episode. If anything, no. it shows the, the complicated nature of war, whether we're an optimistic, trusting institution is it, that's besides the point. The mm-hmm. point is what happens to people when they are afraid. And that's what deep space nine did, did. in its final yeah. seasons. This is what people are willing to do. They have no trust and they're afraid of everything because you don't know who your enemy is. Your enemy is essentially faceless or they look like you. So they brought that idea to star Trek Picard season three, the idea of fear and what we're willing to do in order to feel safe. And that's essentially what was the governing idea behind having these experimentations because the, the Daystrom Institute was trying to experiment to possibly find ways to either weaponize aspects that could destroy the changelings if they ever rise or seeing if they can use them as weapons. And it was a very Dr. Frankenstein type of thing. It because did. It felt it, like it. It, even the way the shape, the shapeshifter, the changeling ro- rose behind the, the doctor, behind the doctor. Oh my God, dude, that gave me chills. It felt like a very, it felt very much like a 1930s horror film. Don't fuck with nature. This is what happens. Yeah. The monster now turns on its creator type of moment. And this goes to like, I have to say, man, this goes to actually Another example of why Terry Metalis is, or uh, Metalis is actually doing a fantastic job as showrunner and as a, as one of the the creatives behind this because he's not afraid of going down this route. Yeah, you're right, David. You are absolutely right, and that's why ultimately I'm okay with what they did because there's a there's purpose. It isn't just trying to tell dark stories for dark stories' sake. There's a purpose here, and what. Some people argue and say Star Trek is is about optimism, but Star Trek is about the human condition. And a lot of that has to do with fear and how we handle our fears. And if that means we need to get a little dirty at times in our Star Trek shows to expose that fear and what it can make us do, then we need to do it. A moment like this works in the narrative's favor, especially when you pose or I guess say not pose, but you set up the idea that we essentially create our own enemies. Yes. 
That's it. <laughs> you said yes. Sorry, I got I, lost there. <laughs> I had a brain fart moment, but yeah, the I thought I, you were going to say something else. I was, but I lost my train of thought. <laughs> you could have seen me on the video. I almost like winked out. But absolutely, it, it, when you bring up about like how we create our own enemies, automatically, just from the statement of times, bring talking about how we're divided as a country. We did that to our, a lot of people say we did that to ourselves. We absolutely did. And you take that into contrast, what's happening in, in the narrative that is going on in Picard season three, Federation did it to itself. And, and in essence, they created their own enemies from within. Yep. Their mistakes created the problems that they're seeing currently. Yeah. So, Interestingly, there are some cool things that came out of this. Um, it would seem that these psychological changes or these physiological changes to the changelings was brought about due to their torture. Yes. The fact that they were continually poked and prodded, put through continuous unspeakable pain in order to adapt and survive, they evolved. They evolved. And it's just like we said, it is Frankenstein. It is the overall concept of Frankenstein's monster. Yeah. The monster turned on its maker. Mm -hmm. And then hence we now have this new changeling that is a hundred times better than the changelings that we normally have, should have dealt with better or. Well, the fact that basically, scary. <laughs> I think both. <laughs> yeah. Because if you think about it, their ability to actually copy the copy a copy a physical object down to a T down to their organs even which mm -hmm. is which makes them so undetectable it absolutely trounces odo as a if we if we were to take to example odo as a changeling and one of the best changelings in star trek history his powers were amazing he was able to do so many amazing things but if you compare these changelings to odo Odo pales in comparison. Yeah. He can't do a lot of the stuff that they can pull off. And I really hope, dude, that basically this isn't like a throwaway villain. Like, I really do. I've always You're stated. about Vatic or the changelings? The changelings themselves. Because, like, I hope this is a continuing thing for Star Trek. For, I love when Star Trek introduces new races and new threats to the Federation. Because me and you have talked about it before. They run things to the crown. They ran, they ran the Klingons into the ground. They ran the Romulans to the ground. They ran the Borg into the ground. And now they're going to do it to the changelings, though? The changelings, though, are different. Are they, though? I mean, they were an enemy for, for the Star Dominion. Trek series for, the for almost five seasons. For five seasons, yeah. But think about this. They took that and changed them into something different now. Because they're now... I wouldn't even consider them the changelings that we saw from TNG. They're completely different now. They're a completely new threat because their power, their, their, their abilities are so much better. So Star Trek Picard has changed the Borg and now changed the changelings. So they're basically postmodern phenomenon at this point where you take you something that, that has been. I didn't think about that. I didn't think about that. It, see, that's, we're getting into critical territory. I don't know if I want to get into that because that does bother me a bit i would like to see new villains mm -hmm. and i'm hoping whoever's on the other side of that the curtain behind that red door is a new face now I, you bring I, up a i very... really hope it's a new face or maybe a familiar situation or familiar association, like something adjacent to something we would understand as Star Trek fans, but ultimately it's a new face. Yeah. I'm I, hoping. I'm hoping because like now you have me thinking about it because although I don't think it will be, I honestly, I honestly was so excited to think of what type of evil entity. Well, let's, could have it been? let's get into that towards the end of the show because yeah. there's a lot of things we can but like a lot of theories now you bring up a little, you threw a monkey wrench into my brain working because like, do I really want them to take something that was from the past and just rework it? It seems to be what they're doing with this show this season. And I don't think that's a negative necessarily. And if it is a familiar face so far, Matalus has, or Metalis has done some really great things. So yeah, probably has. whatever it ends up being will be just fine. 
I'm just being a nitpicky douche here for a second. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so second. let's tackle this Section 31 thing just a bit. There seems to be confusion behind Section 31's plot to use biological warfare on the changelings. I went through social media and I wanted to get a general consensus of what Star Trek fans were were thinking when yeah. it came to this idea. And there's a lot of blogs out there who don't even understand what's happening in Star Trek that are writing things. And I want to make sure people are on the up and up and they're aware of what actually happened when it comes to Star Trek history chronologically. So this was not initiated. The biological warfare on the changelings was not initiated in the events of Picard. These were events that took place 30 years prior as depicted in the events of Deep Space Nine, Deep Space Nine. and was a final measure to end the war that the Federation was losing. This wasn't something they were just doing recently, chronologically closer to Picard's TV show. And that's why these changely decided to attack now, which is what a lot of blogs were putting out. They were blogs pushing this idea that the reason why the changelings attacked is because section 31 tried to kill them. (laughs) (laughs) And I had to go back and read exactly what they were writing. See if I just misread. And I went to five different blogs and they're all seemingly saying the same thing. The, the attack on the changelings wasn't unmotivated. The the attack on the changelings was done because the changelings in deep space nine were already destroying the Federation. Yeah. The Federation was losing the war. So section 31 decided to put together a biological weapon to finally put an end to them. And that happened in D space nine. Yes. Now the group of changelings that are rallied behind Vatic, they are angry about that biological warfare, but that's not, that's not what, when they're talking about that, they're talking about the past. Yes. It's not something that happened last week or two months prior to the events of Picard. Yeah. So just to make sure that's out there, there does seem to be a lot of confusion. People seem to think that the show is alluding to the fact that section 31 started all this. Yeah. And that, that's the thing that basically I wish people would watch deep space, watch deep space nine. What the fuck they're talking about? Because that's, that's the, honestly, when you see articles like that, it makes my head hurt because it's like, these people have not watched all of Star Trek. They know they should know that this element was first established in Deep Space Nine. And one of the things that, you know, me and you could do an entire show on is the reasons why Deep Space Nine wasn't accepted by the fan base. One of the elements was the fact that Deep Space Nine showed the Federation constantly losing. They were losing the war. And a lot of fans did not like that. So, <laughs> so like... A lot of people have to understand the whole story about the changelings and the dominion. They were winning. They were going to win. It took the Federation to do dastard, to do moral things. And that's the whole point moral about moral things or, or immoral, immoral, yeah. immoral things. And well, to make alliances with, with races that they did not there want you to. Go. That's what I was about to say. They had, they created alliances with the Romulans, which that was the capper. Yeah. That was the capper. Yeah. Because remember they they tried to make alliances with the Klingons and that fell through. <laughs> and then, yeah. And then like So there's a lot of history to and I don't think you need to know all this history to enjoy Picard season 3. However, it would help if the people writing those articles <laughs> did. Audiences don't need to know. Yeah. But if you're writing a blog, you probably need to know the entire history of Star Trek in order to write a meaningful and insightful article slash review, because then you get these misconceptions that are being pumped out to the masses. Well, it's also frustrating too, Mike, because think about it. We've had like little tiny explanations in, in throughout Picard season three that explain this. Right. So it seems like they're not even watching the series. (laughs) I think they're just, they're just eager to get out some article. So they get clicks. Exactly. That's probably what it is. Okay, so now that we've gotten to the end of Vatic's story, it also seems that that Vatic and the Changelings might have just simply been pawns or a means to an end for a greater villain hiding in the shadows. Yes. 
I don't think the changelings are the end all villain of season three. No, they had a big part and they definitely have motivations as we have seen throughout season three, especially Vatic and her group of changelings that were tortured. So that much we know, but moving forward, I have a feeling the changelings certainly will still play a part because we know they're, they have assumed certain roles in Feder in, in the Starfleet yes. and Federation. So we know there's, there's lingering changelings, but the end all villain of the season has more to do with Jack Crusher. Yes. And that's the big question mark that's left over for this season really and i guess you can say the reasons behind jack crusher's superpowers <laughs> yes <laughs> how and why are not clearly are not clear yet but now that he's starting to embrace these abilities we're getting a chance to see what's behind everything. and he's learning what he can do he can get into people's heads and take control but my question to you, David, is how do we feel about a character having these types of abilities in Star Trek? And let me preface before you answer. Okay. It's not like we've never seen OP abilities before in Star Trek. Oh, yeah. The after effects of the Vulcan mind meld itself mm -hmm. is hugely OP. I know there are people complaining about Star Trek Discovery Season 1 when Burnham and Sarek communicated across the galaxy. But that was established in the original series. That, yeah. And that's why they have always pulled back from using that, that ability. Because what can you not do if you can essentially communicate across the galaxy to anyone you've ever mind melded with before? Exactly. It's a dangerous territory. You got to be careful. And the same thing applies to Star Trek's Picard's new introduction of this Jack Crusher and his powers. They have to be careful. In my opinion, David, do we continue past Picard with Jack Crusher having these abilities or do we find a way to make them dormant? They're unusable. They have been removed after the defeat of this villain. What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts on that. I thought about that too. After I finished up the last episode in episode eight surrender was like, okay, Am I willing to embrace this new idea that Jack is something new? And I thought about it. The powers do, did bother me, especially in episode seven. But then episode eight happened and I, I got reminded. We also have like beings out there like the Betazoids who can tele telepathically link with people. They allude to the fact that Deanna Troy stole, was trying to steal uh, Riker's, uh, quote unquote grief and take it on to herself. So that is an OP maneuver. Yes, but she's also not doing it across the galaxy. Well, technically she could because the can way she? that, because the way that they remember Riker wasn't mentioning that basically he can feel her. Okay. So yes, David, I will agree that there is room to say she very well could. Yeah. I, they've never said she couldn't. Yeah. But my point is, is that, They've never tried to do that. Exactly. Because they're keeping OP powers at a minimum. Mm -hmm. So now bring it back to Jack Crusher. Do you think we can have a character who has the abilities of, say, a mutant from X-Men be a part of Star Trek? I think so. Uh, after, afterwards, if you asked me right when I finished episode eight, I would have said no. We have to down downplay him. We have to degrade his powers. However, given the right writing, the powers are just like any other element in a character. It's just a trait to that character. When it comes down to it is how is that character written? And if that, if that character is written well, powers be damned. You can still do it. He can still be a dynamic character. And I think that, that Picard season three, Jack, has actually been written pretty damn well. He's actually a very interesting character because he, he, we got to see this character who is more than just the powers. Right. He, he's more than yes, Picard's son. David, I understand that, but let's bring it back to, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just trying to throw you some, some hard balls here. Yeah. Food for thought. Yes. Okay. Let's look at Saru. Mm -hmm. Saru, 
as we had seen in season two of Discovery when he lost his ganglii and they essentially <laughs> showed that they should have been predators. Yes. Not prey. We saw him use his powers in one episode mm -hmm. where he took out a bunch of people around him with his little, little weapons around his neck. Yeah. The needles. They have never gone back to that. Why haven't they? Because they have found reasons just like for the past five decades, they have found reasons to essentially mute some of the over the top OP abilities in Star Trek, specifically the mind melding aspects, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And they have done the same thing with Saru because do you really have a character? Should you have a character that could shoot needles outside your body and essentially take out everyone around you? You, you, you can be an away team of one at that point. So the question is though, can you do the same thing with Jack Crusher without creating questions within the audience, wondering why he doesn't use his abilities? Yeah. And I still say, I think you can. I think you can, especially the problem with Saru too. To, to, is having you questioned that yourself? I've always questioned like, why that. don't they use that with Saru anymore? They just seemingly had forgotten that he has that ability. But you got to remember that comes down to also also the creative and the writer. That has been the one thing that I pointed out uh, uh, is one of the negatives of uh, discovery. Inconsistencies, inconsistencies, with Saru, especially with Saru. Yeah, and that yeah. comes down to to writing. If you're not actually paying attention as a writer, saying, "Hey, my this character has this." I can use this or this doesn't work in his scenario. I have to remove him somehow. Like maybe he's not part of the away team. Maybe he's off doing another duty, but they never did. With Jack, I, I'm hoping, I think this comes down to the fact that I believe in, in the creatives now in, in Picard. And I believe that they can do it. I believe that this character can actually be written to make his powers work. Okay. I, I don't necessarily disagree. And I do like your point about it all comes down to the writing. Cause that's essentially, that's really what it does come down to. Everything can work. Anything can work on paper. It's, it's about execution, execution, how you do it. Okay. So in episode eight, Troy says there's a darkness on board. As soon as she <laughs> enters yep. or boards the Titan, then moments later, she clarifies that the darkness is not Jack or it is not in Jack, which signifies that he's a good person. Yes. Which I'm glad, but it's around him and passing through him and a weak and ancient voice. That's the thing that, that caught my, that I just zeroed in on. It's weak, but it's ancient. What the hell is it? <laughs> the question I have is, will this ancient entity be something connected to Jack because of the crusher Beverly bloodline. Oh, they are wait. leading us to think it's connected to Picard because yeah. his body was stolen. But I'm wondering if this will connect to the individual formerly known as Wesley Crusher, because we also know <laughs> he was special. Yes. That is why he became the traveler. You're right. So if Wesley was special and became a super being, Yes. And Jack Crusher now has super being type powers. I'm feeling like it's less and less about Picard and more about something pertaining to the Crusher bloodline. By Jove, I think you have it. Do you it, think that's what it is? I think it's that. I think you nailed it on the head. You beat me to the punch. Because what's the chances of Beverly Crusher having two children that are both that are super both beings? Super beings because, yeah. Wesley was considered a super being because he joined the traveler and became a, the traveler. So unless she's got that divine womb, you know, just, <laughs> <laughs> well, she, she almost got, you know, impregnated by a, a, a ghost at one point. Remember? That's true. That ghost would have been special. <laughs> that ghost would have been special. Ghost baby would have been special. <laughs> <laughs> and like, it could be the, the, the fact that it's whatever is in Beverly Crusher's DNA or her, Special bloodline. Yeah. Mixing with Picard's genetics. It, yeah. That's why you have Jack as the anomaly. Correct. Yeah. So Th I that's think what I'm thinking. You're onto something. I was constantly just zeroing in on, okay, who in Picard's past is ancient evil and wants revenge on Picard. No, I'm not saying that. I don't, I don't know if there's going to be a direct connection to say Wesley Crusher, but no, 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 it has to be. It has to be. It has to be direct. Now I'm not saying 
Jack Crush. I don't know what I'm saying, David. I'm so excited and confused at the same time. Well, no, because you, you Jack you're, Crusher. You just went through the door, Mike. I know. I'm not <laughs> saying Jack Crusher is going to be a traveler. No, I'm saying I there's something like about Dr. Crusher, Beverly Crusher's past, her bloodline, something about her that has managed to give life to two children that are both special. In that way, there should be at least a connection to Wesley Crusher. Yes. And it would, it would make, this is one thing that I've been wondering about is like, no one's really mentioned the elephant in the room. Where the heck is Wesley throughout the entire season? Well, they, he's not supposed to interfere. In he's anything. not supposed to interfere, but now that you bring that up, that's, that's very true. You have essentially two, uh, uh, her first child obviously became the traveler. And I was thinking to myself, I thought it would only be about Picard. That's why Jack's special. It's something to do with Picard. But now I'm like scouring through my TNG like list. Like, okay, what episodes did Beverly do where she got into some trouble? I think the answer to this season has more to do with Beverly Crusher. Than we thought. Than we thought. I think so too now because... I think they're mis- they have- I think they're doing misdirection with Picard. Yeah. Obviously Picard has some it's his show and there's going to be some reason why. They 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 removed a part of his brain for a reason. So yeah. th- that much is clear. There's a reason why they wanted his body and it does have its connections to Jack Crusher. But ultimately, the reason why Jack Crusher was born a certain way has everything to do with who Beverly Crusher is. is. And Automatically, dude, I definitely think that we have to see Will Wheaton in the season. I would normally disagree with you, but in some way, he's either go- he has to be mentioned. You think that's- so we can have that connection, or he has to make an appearance in some is- in some way? But they got to be careful with it, though. Is that how they remove Jack from the equation? Then, because the easiest way to remove Jack, this omnipotent character, is for him to join his brother. Essentially, his half brother, because yeah. Wesley would just take him off the board. Like, per, we know Star Trek has their super beings. Yeah, we know this. It, there's a whole entire pantheon of super beings in Star Trek. Q was one of them. Yeah, but Q's off the board now at this point. Right. So perhaps these two men, Wesley Crusher and Jack Crusher, Crusher. perhaps they are part of this pantheon in some way. <laughs> Oh I know it God. sounds like it's over the top, David, but it does seem like the breadcrumbs are there. The breadcrumbs are there and the narrative beats are there too. Yeah. Because the, the most, I'm not going to say Wesley was the most ex- insignificant character in TNG, but he was, and he was certainly the most divisive, but I've always liked him. I've always liked him, I, but I know that there's been Star Trek him. fans. I'm, yeah. That well, hate him. Well, I definitely <laughs> mocked him in the show. Oh but yeah. I thought his story was fine. Yeah. I thought I thought, his story was good, but it, you look at the narrative that Wesley's story was going, there was something special that was going down the line with him. And then you get to him becoming the traveler. It was his through line from the very beginning. Yeah. And now we have Jack who comes from the same bloodline as a traveler. Yeah, I could see this actually being like, oh, they they became they became part of that pantheon. Yeah, so we'll see. We got to get answers soon. <laughs> you we came have... up with the you you had the tinfoil hat on. That is freaking yeah. awesome. <laughs> well, the show's going down a, a very supernatural route, seemingly, and I use supernatural very loosely. Very because loosely. we know everything in Star Trek is is more or less connected or grounded in some type of science. But we'll get the answer soon. We, I, I believe it's going to be as, as early, or at least some of the answers, as early as the very beginning of Episode 9, because yeah. the way Episode 8 ended with Deanna Troy guiding Jack through that doorway, I can't imagine them fucking with us for, you know, 50 minutes through Episode <laughs> nine. 9. Yeah, I don't think that... I think we have to see the immediate effects. Yeah. Especially because that's the penul- penultimate episode, and it seems like they have a lot, a lot more things they have to wrap up. We still need to spend some time with our main threat too. Yeah. 
So, so yeah. there's there's a lot of stuff to ground to cover still. Yeah, I'm not stressed out though. I still feel good, David. I know this time, uh, this exact same time during season one, we were already throwing shit at the wall. We were confused, like what the fuck's happening? You guys have lost your story. Why are you doing this? Whereas this season still moving into episode nine is is still strong. Yeah. I don't feel like there's been any mistakes. All right. So all of the data and lore stuff across both episodes were some of the most emotionally impactful things we've seen in Star Trek in a while. Did you cry um, like I did when I saw Spot? <laughs> yes. And also the the Jordy's moment with data when he, when he's talking to him. Yeah about being his friend. Uh, yeah, that got me. That got you. Because we know that Jordy and Data have always had this very special bond. You know? Oh, yeah. And I just, it was, I'm glad we were able to get that moment. Well, as scary as it sounds, if you think back to Nemesis, a lot of Star Trek fans were wondering about that. Where, like, we saw Picard, the effect of the death of Data on Picard. But I remember a lot of Star Trek fans like going, what the hell? What about Jordy? What yeah. did he think? What he, and, his friend just blew himself up. Unfortunately, when you're dealing with a feature film, you don't really have time to go into all of the those details, deal with the aftermath of, of such a sad moment. So they chose to focus on Picard's reaction, which was fitting for the movie. But here we are 20 some years later and we're being given little bits of closure things that yeah. we didn't really ever think we were going to get or even possibly even needed but here we are and we're being given them and it feels so right that's something that metallus has done so well he has despite some of the there may be some controversy out there i know there's some people that are that are not entirely happy with what metallus is doing but you can't argue that you can't disagree that metallus has expertly found ways to interweave his story into past iterations of Trek in a relatively seamless fashion. Oh yeah, absolutely. By adding like almost like this heart to the story that using not the, like the, not the nostalgia berries to basically make, basically people say, you know, remember this, remember this? No, it's to add almost like an emotional beat to his, to his story to, to the themes that he's talking about. I'm sorry, the whole thing about the thorough line from start of season three has been about legacy. This is about everyone's legacy. And episode eight was such a poignant moment for everyone's legacy because we finally got to see how everyone felt about data. You know, down to them sitting around the, the, the table together after so many years and then tell, telling each other, yeah, we missed each other. And they all tell, they all tell how much they missed each other in their own special way. My favorite way was Worf because, you know, him saying, I wanted to, I've slayed many enemies and I thought about sending you, sending uh, their decapitated heads to you guys. But I was told that that was a passive aggressive thing. <laughs> I thought that was genius. That's, that is how you get those emotional beats in a story and give your story story substance yeah now i believe we made a joke i think it was our last during our last episode that metallus was essentially retconning things that shabun had done <laughs> well yeah to be <laughs> to be more accurate i like to say retconning just because it gives an extra little dig towards shaban, shaban. but what what actually metallus is doing is the professional thing and he is recontextualizing things that might not have worked very well. And this episode doubles down on this notion by taking Data's evolution down a more powerful and satisfying conclusion. Yes. Rather than giving us the, the impression that Data has been suffering inside some computer chip for 30 some years, whereby he elects to die and he chooses to experience death rather than living in this continual or perpetual stasis, we get an instance that is less tragic and is more appropriately optimistic. Yeah. A path to experience humanity at its in, fullest in a way that he had always thought he would want data. I mean, that's, that's how we've always wanted this to end for data. And though we were given that sad ending in nemesis, it did work for the purposes of bringing 
at that time they were ending the TNG era essentially yeah. and trying to wrap up storylines. And it did work that data sacrificed himself. That was the ultimate for the director of nemesis and the writer of nemesis. That was the ultimate their idea way. of data understanding humanity was yes. through sacrifice. Exactly. That was the ultimate final human thing that data just had to come to understand. Right. You know, and it did work if that was truly the end and bringing him back in this way, I felt is the all the biggest cheat maneuver in all of movies and TV. <laughs> and yet it fucking works. You know, he bypasses the Shaban data and essentially gives us the nemesis data, our all true data. Well, and the, the amazing part too is like the way he handles the data story here pays more homage to the actual roots of that character. You know, the moments between him and lore, when he's telling lore about memories, my brain started actually going back to data talking to his father and actually telling his, you know, the whole mean you have talked about that discussion and not in, in nauseam about how, like, why do, why do humans keep old things? It's because they have memory, they have legacy. Why do they have children? Because their legacy goes on. Well, also bringing up the fact that those things are memories. They are legacy. They are what makes him him. And then bringing that back to this and then taking what Shaban took and say, yes, death is part of the human equation. That is something he had to go through to understand being human. But it's a memory. But that was also more bleak. I get your point, but that was all. I think Shaban made a mistake with that. Yeah. That was bleak. This was idea bleak. that Data wanted to die. Yeah. It it didn't sit well with me. It never did. It was a sad moment. It was a highly emotional moment that I did like between Brent Spiner and Patrick Stewart's performances. It was great. They brought out those emotions. But when you really die, forget the nostalgia, forget that we love those characters and really think what that scene did. Fucking it was wrong. It just didn't work. In my opinion, it was too tragic. Yes. In Nemesis, it wasn't tragic. It was sacrifice. It was sacrifice. That was, please kill me now. I'm in perpetual stasis where nothing happens. Let me, let me experience death, please. Yeah. And that's why, that's why it was interesting taking that idea and then flipping on its head when Data now wants to experience new things. And when he cracks his neck and he says, oh, that's new. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, the entire thing was really interesting how they did it. Not only was it just great narratively, but just in the way they created this idea of memories, you know, using data's, I guess you can say like a metaphysical explore exploration into his memories. Yes. It, Metallus and his writers opted to have data go through this type of Cartesian exploration into his mind. Yes. You know, as you mentioned, memories define him. That's what he him. said. He said, memories define me. I am who I am because they exist. And the idea of data giving lore everything because he had nothing. He had nothing. Which was also almost a gift, even though it was his way of destroying him. He also gave him what he never had. Yes. And in essence, it wasn't so much as a defeat as it was a reconciliation. Yeah. And that's what I like the most about it. Sure, Lore's deviousness has been absorbed, but he's still there. He's still there. And like the thing I loved about that, that was the bow that I think I needed as a fan of that narrative between Lore and Data. Because Lore, this whole time, has been, well, I'm the better brother. I'm the better brother because of this and this and this. But in actuality, it harkens back to what their father told them. The problem with lore was the fact that he thought too materialistically. He didn't think of the substance. He didn't, he couldn't process that. He can't process what, why life is important, why memories are important. Experience is important. He couldn't process it. And that's what drove him to, you know, kill his father. But like data at the very end of their you know, reconciliation, because I do, I, I, I 100% agree with you that that scene is data and lore reconcili reconciliation for the two brothers. 
data giving lore that so that lore's final moments is him understanding what the ultimate lesson was. That's the metaphysical aspect about it. The fact that data was able to defeat lore was yes. because lore finally understood why data was who he was. Yes. By giving him everything, he essentially became him. He became him. How and, awesome and perfect is that? Yes. And it, it, it is the absolute best bow. I mean, I don't want to see any more, any more ties to the, the Sung this is storyline. This is it. This is it. This we, is it. If you want to do Sung storylines, this is how we do them now because yeah. data has everyone that of importance inside of him. Inside he, of it's him. what has, it's what has created who he is now. Currently, he's still very much data, but he's much more. And this is what they need to do moving forward. Do not do anything else with data. Leave the man alone. <laughs> you have finally successfully justified having Brent Spiner around. You, you justified data's existence. Yeah. And also the fact that he can now age David. Yes. Let's remove ourselves from the story for a moment. Cause just one thing that it's always bothered me and I get it. It comes with the territory when you're dealing with an Android because you know, five years in the TNG, he started looking different. Yes. By the end of TNG, you can tell he put on a good 20 pounds and not because he was, be he was becoming overweight, but that's just how it is. As we get older, we gain certain fat in different places in our face. He no longer looked like he did in the first season. So now here we are finally justifying why he looks different. We no longer have to pretend, you know, give him a bunch of silly makeup and or do, or do visual effects. Now he can just be exactly who Bert Spiner is as he's aging. We don't have to play gimmicks anymore. So if we do move forward with data, which I wouldn't mind moving forward with, with data and another show, because I feel like now that he's he's evolved, we can do so much more now. With yeah, this we can character. do so much stories. Maybe with he can go uh, blow up his uh, that planet that <laughs> doesn't need to exist. <laughs> <laughs> he just goes back there. Uh, I'm going to remove you oh, guys. So you from guys existence. are all my children. Not really. You're the children of the other <laughs> me that no longer exists and was retconned. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> what happens if they come back? I want to see if they come back, Mike. <laughs> It does need to be addressed. It has to be addressed. Now, because Alton Soong is also part of Data, he obviously knows of their existence. Yeah. So if we end the show or end the season with Data going to that planet, I would be okay with that. Even if it's just a quick mention, because then it acknowledges something from the first season that we've never gone back <laughs> it to. It doesn't give it a finger. It just, yeah. it just basically, we go here, we'll give Shaban a bone <laughs> to say data went back. Yeah. Now I do make a lot of jokes about this whole retconning or recontextualizing the Shaban stuff, but, and I'm not trying to I'm not speaking for Metallus and saying, this is what Metallus is trying to do. He's jabbing Shaban. However you want to look at it, he is trying to smooth out the things that Shaban did. For example, bringing up what Data had said to Picard about wanting to experience death. Yeah. He didn't ignore it. If anything, he's respecting what Shaban had done yeah. in order to reverse it and smooth it out a bit. Yeah, because even even him bringing up the fact with that uh, dialogue with Jordy that he basically says that Data found his peace. Right. There you go. Yeah. That's all we needed. That's all we needed. You're respecting the prior season, but also allowing us to effectively move past while smoothing out those rough edges. All right. So these two episodes also gave us a more, more, a lot more on Troy and Riker and what really went wrong with them. Wow, dude. I didn't know we could go. We could take that, that strange, strange relationship of Troy and Riker from season one and really put it in a really interesting light. Well, they brought them in during the first season, gave us, essentially one episode with the two of them where they then in one episode explored this idea that they've had problems that they've been struggling with the death of their son. Understandably too, when you put it in that context, but that was all we were ever given. Yeah. Now here we are two seasons later and Matalus or Metalis is doing exactly what he's been doing all season and he's finessing things. He gives us way more 
he gives us a more heartfelt, well-conceived moment that explains exactly where they've been the last 20 years, emotionally speaking. He gives us uh, context. He, there you he go. He gives us context. The idea it. that Troy felt everyone's grief, we understand that. Yeah. But the fact that she cared for Riker so much that she tried to help Riker deal with his pain by absorbing it. Yes. Taking it away from him, which is a loving thing, but it's a terrible thing when you think about it because Riker never was able to deal with it. Exactly. And it goes, it, it touches on one of the biggest uh, lessons that Star Trek has always, you know, morally have tried to teach people. I mean, back at, even to the original crew, my pain is what makes me Star Trek five. Yeah. Don't take away my pain. And my pain is who is what makes me who I am. Yeah. And essentially the fact that, yes, you're right. What Troy was doing was something that was from a loved one's perspective. And I love the fact that Troy said, I did the wrong thing because I did the one thing as a counselor. Mm -hmm. I did not allow you to do. And it's grief. And it's grief. But she came at it as a loved one. Right. And it, and the choice of dialogue during that whole thing, dude, was so wonderful because every time I could see a moment when someone might say, ah, no, 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 that's, that's wrong. All of a sudden more context. Okay. Now that's understandable. I think the moment between the two of them in this episode in episode nah, eight. Yes. That scene was in episode eight. Yeah. want to make sure I'm not crossing oh, no, it was streams here. Eight. That moment was probably the best moment we've ever seen in all of Star Trek between Troy and Riker, without a doubt. Yeah, because we, we got, it's more, we got to actually, they don't, they, they didn't feel like one dimensional characters. And also in TNG, it was a very, it was a very, I don't want to say a shallow relationship because it wasn't. It was romantic, but it was also not the time. Yes. For that romance to take place. So they always were on again, off again. Troy saw other people. Riker saw other people. But they always had, there was always this general feeling that eventually at some point they would end up together when yeah. the time was right. Oh, yeah. Even though Worf throw a curveball. <laughs> Thank you I want to say starting up. in season six. Yes. When he needed help with his son in TNG. When Alexander came to live with Worf. Troy became a part of their life a lot more. Yeah. She almost became like a surrogate mother. Right. And then that's when Troy and Worf started having their own little romance. It was subtle, but it was there. And that's why they gave us that season finale. The all good things all come good to things. an end. The, the season, the series finale for TNG, where they gave us that glimpse into a future that never happened, where Worf and Riker were at odds. And it had everything to do with Deanna Troy. Yes. So here we are again being brought back and giving us that little reminder when Worf and Troy saw each other in, <laughs> in this episode. I mean, when Riker said that's inappropriate. And Worf is like, whatever. <laughs> I liked it because Worf always had a thing for Troy. And yeah, and Worf has no social cues. <laughs> he doesn't, he doesn't care. <laughs> he doesn't yeah. care. He, he doesn't think about like, you know. What's socially appropriate? That's been part of Worf. I just like that Metallus doesn't forget a thing. He either went back and watched every episode of Star Trek he could possibly get his hands on before starting production on season three, or he just has a brilliant memory because he seemingly touches on everything that you would expect. Yes a writer who understands Star Trek, all levels of Star Trek to touch on. Well, you know, it's for the t amount of time that me and you have covered the franchise of Star Trek. We always see many showrunners and many producers come in and say, they are a fan of Star Trek. We know Star Trek because we're fans, you know, Michael Shaban with his shirt. I'm a Star Trek fan, <laughs> which was so, ugh. yeah, but Mata uh, Metallus actually feels like, no, he's a Star Trek fan. He understands, but he's not like parading it. He parades it through his writing. Well, he's the balance that we always talk about. Give us true fans. If you're going to hire a director, writer, whatever, 
for a franchise that's been around for decades. It's built a fandom, whether it be Star Wars or Star Trek or Harry Potter or Doctor Who. Make sure they're not just an Uber fan, but also make sure they're a capable writer that can walk the tightrope of balance. Yeah. And that's what Metallus has done. He has found that middle ground oh, between yeah. fan and professional yeah <laughs> professional yeah there you go i mean i, the, it I was sounds, trying to look for another word but i that will do it sounds like it sounds like in a negative context but honestly that's the truth it's a professional writer but he's still a fan he understands the history and he also understands where he needs to pull himself back he can't be an uber nerd and say and then we're gonna do this yeah it has to make sense we can't make yeah. seven love other women and have, have her scissor with people oh why not <laughs> all right so moving into the final episodes we still have several big questions one big ones why did the changeling steal Picard's body and remove the sections that were infected Two. What is Jack Crusher's part in all of this? And three, who is the main villain? Who is the entity or face behind that red door? And, and the biggest thing, too, that I thought about after, after this episode, what is the importance of Federation that, that this specific day, Federation Day, I understand it's a celebration of Federation, but it was specifically chosen by this entity that this is the day that I need to make my statement. Why? What's the importance of this day? Because like, remember they throughout the entire episodes, Mike Metallus has always been using one little dialogue to always bring it around and say, we're only six days from, from Federation day. We're only, we're only nine hours from Federation day. Why the hell is this day so important? Okay, David. So, I'm going to give episode seven and 89%. Okay. That is the dominion episode. And then episode eight surrender. I will give a 96%. That's actually really interesting. I gave the episode seven, a lower, a lower score. It's still 85. Okay. Uh, but it was followed up by a hell of an episode that I followed it up with a hundred. Uh, oh, come on, David. Mike, the stuff with Data and Lore yeah. was awesome. It harkened back to the stuff that me mm -hmm. and you started this this show okay. about. All right, here. I'm not going to argue with you. That's fine. You had the Jordy moment. You had everything. And you still had an episode that moved us forward for a lot of the other characters to go out and explain. I really, Jack's story has gotten really interesting. And I like that dynamic that he... If they were to, after Picard ends, and if they say Jack is going to be one of the main characters for Star Trek Legacy, I can get behind that. I can absolutely get behind that. Put him on the ship with, on Titan with Seven and uh, uh, our favorite grumpy I, I captain think, of all time. Yeah, I think we already know who the crew is going to be. It's going to be LaForge's daughter. Yeah. Seven and Nine, Captain Shaw. Shaw. And... And Jack. And Jack Crusher. I, to me, those four heart of this alleged Star Trek legacy series that Matalus is working on. Yeah. And that I can get behind that. All four of those characters have been done expertly and continued on. I mean, even like, even like with Shaw and Seven's moments in this episode, it's still strengthened their relationship. Yeah. So yep. I honestly think it's a hundred. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to leave everyone on that note. We will be back with episode nine very soon. Thank you, David. Thank you. Live long and prosper. I couldn't help but notice your pain. My pain? It runs deep. Share it with me. End simulation.